Alrighty, and we are all recorded. So, today we're talking about pendulums being simple harmonic oscillators. So, the, the key kind of question is, well, what's the restoring force for a pendulum? Now, remember, to make this work as a simple harmonic oscillator, right, for this sort of behavior, we need that a restoring force, and I'll just call it FR here, is linear with our displacement. You know, for a spring it was X for, for everything else. Well, what, what makes it come back? Well, we've got the right idea there. Gravity is going to be a restoring force, but is it just straight up FG or is it some portion of FG, right? Well, if we think about a pendulum, so we've got a straight line, we've got some sort of bob down at the bottom. If I pull it out here to the side, the path of the pendulum is kind of going to be this curved path, right? We could think of it going all the way out to, to you know, some point over here too, right? Where we have our, our ball pendulums going swing back and forth. So our restoring force is the force that pulls it back towards equilibrium. Well, gravity would pull it straight down, right? If we think about the free body diagram of this pendulum bob, we've got something like this where we have a gravitational force pulling straight down, right? And then we've got a tension force along the rope pulling up the other way, right? So the tension force always points perpendicular to the path of the pendulum, right? As the pendulum swings along this path, the tension force is always going to be perpendicular to that path. So we could think about taking our gravitational force and breaking it down into two components. We'd have a component that's going to point opposite our tension force. That's the red one here. And we'll have another component here that's going to point kind of perpendicular to the tension force. Well, it's this blue one here that points along the path where we're going to take. So this is going to be a restoring force. Well, what is that one going to be? Um, well, we need an angle, for example, to figure this out. We could call this angle theta. And that angle theta would also be the angle between this black and this red vector as well. And so now FR, restoring force, is the force or opposite that, right? So we'd say for a pendulum that a restoring force is equal to, well, m times g times the sine of theta. Um, regarding slack in the line, we're not going to worry about that, and I'll explain why in a, in a few minutes here, guys. Um, so, is this restoring force going to increase linearly as I pull my pendulum away from my equilibrium position? Does mg sine theta increase in a linear manner the more I pull it out? Anyone know what sine of theta looks like if I were to graph that? Uh, oh, it says uh, fr is linear with x, like the, the displacement. So this was for a spring, right? And this is a requirement for a simple harmonic oscillator is, is we have that linear relationship between, <coughs> pardon me, FR and X. <coughs> so MG sine theta, what does that look like? Well, if you have a graphing calculator, you could go to the graphing function that y equals, type in sine x, and graph it. What does it look like? 
Well, this, if you graph it out, looks something like this. And everyone taking math 30-1 just had flashbacks. Um, so it's not linear. There's a problem with this. Okay. Well, does that mean we, we have to completely scrap this idea of a pendulum being a simple harmonic oscillator? We've said for, for anything to be a simple harmonic oscillator, the requirement is that the restoring force is linearly dependent on the displacement from equilibrium. So are we just out of luck? Well, would I have spent this long explaining this and have a slide saying pendulum is a simple harmonic oscillator to start it off and then go, well, no, we're done. Uh, it's out. Well, the answer is no. So if we zoom in on a portion of this, and this graph is from your textbook. So the dashed line, this is a linear relationship here. Okay. Um, the solid line, this is sine theta. Well, if we look down here, hey, that's pretty close. But as we get further and further up, you can see that these two lines start diverging more and more. And so the answer to this question, can pendulums ever behave like a similar harmonic oscillator? The answer is yes. Down here, the difference between a linear relationship and sine theta is uh, less than about 0.1% difference, right? between the linear and, and the sine of theta. Now, as we get bigger and bigger, eventually it becomes a 1% difference, and then it becomes even bigger. And you can see by the time we get out to 90, um, clearly there's a, there's a pretty big shift going on there. <coughs> so the answer to this question is, at small angles, we can say that sine of theta is approximately linear. It's not going to be perfectly linear. We're not going to be able to look at it and go, oh yeah, that's, that's a nice straight line relationship. But we're able to look at it and go, it's close enough that we can say it's linear. And these small angles that we're talking about are going to be angles under 10 degrees. Okay. So for angles under 10 degrees, our pendulum is going to be a simple harmonic oscillator. For angles over 10 degrees, our pendulum is not a simple harmonic oscillator. Now we've got to be careful because there's still physics we can do with a pendulum when it's not a simple harmonic oscillator. But there's some physics we can only use if it is a simple harmonic oscillator. So just keep this in mind, this, this limitation here. If we are over 10 degrees, we need to be thinking carefully about stuff. If we're under 10 degrees, then it's a simple harmonic oscillator and we're all right. Okay. And all this stems from this idea that in this 0 to 10 degree region of this graph, a linear line, uh, relationship and sine of theta are approximately the same. Uh, you'll see this show up through other areas of physics. It's called the small angle approximation. And uh, we use it all sorts of places where, you know, it's easier to deal with something in a, in a linear relationship, but we can create that. <clears throat> in particular, um, it becomes really important in, in physics 30 in some areas. So, we have period, we have velocity equations for a horizontal spring. Can we use any of those ideas for a pendulum? Well, 
And then a second question is, what properties of a pendulum actually affect its pure harmonic motion? Do we need to work with them in the same way? So let's look at the period situation first. So for a horizontal spring, we had this equation, right? Period is equal to 2 pi times the square root of m over k. So how, how well does this actually work? Well, if this is our spring side, and then this will be our pendulum side. So I guess the first question we need to ask ourselves is, uh, what is the spring constant equivalent of a pendulum? Because we could always think about mass. The mass would be hanging on the bottom. But what would be the equivalent of k b? Well, if we think to the restoring force for a spring, our restoring force was k x, right? For a pendulum, our restoring force was mg sine theta. Now, we've hit an issue. Uh, there's no x in this, so we need to come up with an x. Well, what is x for a pendulum? I'm going to just draw this sort of thing again. X, if you remember, was how far we kind of pulled it over this way. That's what we called X. So, you know, the pendulum here has been displaced by X, essentially. Well, the length of that pendulum is L. If this angle here is theta, then sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So sine of theta, this right here, is equal to x over l, how far we've displaced it divided by the length of the pendulum. That makes sense? So you can say, well, our restoring force of our pendulum could then be considered to be mg over l times x. Just making the substitution of x over l equals sine theta. Well now we have a, and I'm using air quotes here, you can't see it, but a spring constant for a pendulum. right? The kind of k equivalent would be mg over l, right? We're, we're basically drawing comparisons between those two equations. That makes sense. Any questions about that? So, we could sub this spring constant into our equation for a simple harmonic oscillator, right? And what we'll get out is we'll get out that t is equal to 2 pi times the square root of L over G. And if you don't, uh, don't believe me on that, um, I encourage you to try the substitution rearrangement yourself. Now this equation is on your formula sheet, but it's worth noting that this equation is only for simple harmonic oscillators. So what does that mean? If I have an equation that only applies to a simple harmonically oscillating pendulum, are there any restrictions on when I can use it? Yeah, 
this is only good if our angle of our pendulum is under 10 degrees. If we're over 10 degrees, we cannot use this equation. Okay, so keep that in mind. This equation comes with restrictions. But it's interesting because it also tells us something about what's going on or what affects the period of our pendulum, right? If we think about what properties of a pendulum affect its harmonic motion, well, uh, less than or equal to um, would be the, the best, I guess, definition. And depending on who you talk to, this small angle thing uh, varies a little bit. Um, some people are content with under 15 degrees, some people are content with under 12, some people would say, oh no, only under 5. Um, under 10 is, is where I feel is accurate, and that's also where um, Physics 30 feels it is accurate. So uh, when you're looking at doing small angle stuff in Physics 30, um, knowing that it's under 10 degrees will get you the correct answer if it's a question where they're testing to see whether you know when you should use a certain equation or when you shouldn't. Um, so this is interesting. So we've kind of answered this, you know, what properties of a pendulum affect its harmonic motion? Well, interestingly, the length of it and the gravity gravitational field of the planet it's on the mass we hang at the end of it doesn't matter. The angle we pull it to doesn't matter as long as it is under 10 degrees. It's only the length and that value of, of G that um, varies with period. Um, and this actually ends up being a really accurate way to measure gravitational field strength. You set up a, a nice pendulum, you, you map out a number of lengths and you time it for a number of oscillations and uh, you'll get some periods and, and you can calculate a G really, really accurately for it. Okay. Um, incidentally, just in case, sorry, just in case you're not sure, a period of a pendulum is all the way there and then all the way back. So don't uh, don't get caught off guard by that, right? It's a there and back. Now what about velocity? So for velocity, we used energy, right? Well, can we do the same thing with our pendulum? Well, and the answer here is, yeah, we can. But we need to know this height, right? Because I could say at point one versus point Two. At point one, there's just gravitational energy. At point two, there's just kinetic energy. And so these two energies would be equivalent to each other or equal to each other. But I might not be given this H. But what I can do is I can divide this up and uh, both these black lines are going to have a length of L, the length of the pendulum, right? Well, I can use some trig to figure out the length of this blue line if I know the angle I've pulled it to, right? The blue length would have a, a length of, well, L times, now we're the adjacent, the cosine of theta. But that doesn't get me all the way there, right? I need, I need this little bit down here that's in green. Well, I could find that by taking my length and subtracting that blue line. And so my height, H, would be equal to the black line, L, minus the blue line, L cos theta.
And yeah, it's it's simple trig, but it's a little bit more complicated because it's not just one side of the triangle, right? Um, we have to remember that we're uh, this says blue line really badly. I don't know if that helped. I don't think it did. There we go. Okay. Once we have that, it, it's a pretty easy calculation, right? We can just do M G H equals one half M V squared. The M's are going to cancel out and we can just go, okay, V equals two G H square root it. And we might have to take this and sub it in down there, right? So we might have to say, well, 2G times L minus L cos theta. Square root it to get a V. Now, interesting thing about this. Did we use any simple harmonic oscillator properties to arrive at this V. Did we use anything that relied on it? Uh, the two black L's are the same. That would be the length of the pendulum. But the blue line would not generally be given to you. You'd have to know that if I gave you the angle, you could go, okay, the length of the pendulum times the cosine of that angle to get that line and then subtract it from the L. But we didn't actually use any simple harmonic stuff to get this answer. We used energy, but the energy stuff doesn't rely on it being a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, yes, sorry, these, these should be both the black L. Yeah. Um, so this always works. And of course you get it from, from just energy stuff, the stuff we did, did in the last outcome. <coughs> so it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be too much of a problem to kind of take it from, okay, gravitational equals kinetic and work your way through. You just have to remember this little kind of trick of geometry to get uh, a height out. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Oh, maybe one. Then we'll look at an example here. Okay, we'll move on to the example. If anything comes up, just post it in the chat. So let's say we have an 80 centimeter long pendulum. We hang a 10 gram mass on the end of it. We release it from an angle of eight degrees. We want to know a few things. We want to know what the restoring force on the pendulum is. We want to know what the period of the pendulum is. We want to know what the speed of the pendulum is as it goes past the equilibrium point. So basically, we're hitting all the main things that we might want to know about pendulums. Um, and this. And uh, as we look at it, we've got, got a few things. We've got uh, 80 centimeters. That would be the length. So that would be our L. We've got a mass on the end of it. Right? And then we've got an angle. And we're going to work under the assumption that we're on Earth because that's where most pendulum experiments tend to happen. I'd probably have to tell you if we were talking about like the Mars rover doing a pendulum experiment. So for A, we've got to remember it's not just FG, right? The restoring force is going to be that component of FG that pulls it back towards equilibrium. 
So we're looking at this being mg sine theta. Right? And so we could go ahead and we could put our numbers in and we could calculate that. We've got to remember to do things like convert our units. So we have 0 0.01 kilograms. Our, uh, our value of g is 9.81 as we're on Earth. And then we have our sine, and this is of 8 degrees. And the only trick you need to really watch out for here is making sure that your calculator is in degree mode. And it looks like we have some consensus over there. People punching it into a calculator. Uh, 0 0.014 newtons, it looks like it calculates out to when we round off for digits. Yeah. And so that's a, that's a pretty straightforward starting calculation. Um, the only thing that can be tricky about this is, is you got to know how we get this F restoring formula to start with, right? If you don't know how to come up with that, then, then we're going, you're going to run into a bit of a wall here, right? But otherwise it's, it's a pretty straightforward calculation. Now when we get to the period of the pendulum, things are even easier. But there's always something we need to ask ourselves. And the thing we need to ask yourself here is, are we in simple harmonic motion? We're in this case where we want to grab this equation and just toss our numbers into it, right? And, and not really worry about uh, anything else. Before you use this equation, you always need to think, are we under 10 degrees? And yeah, we're under 10 degrees, right? We're at 8 degrees. So we're A-OK -okay to use it. Um, but you want to be thinking to yourself, am I OK to use this equation here? Now, if you're not OK to use it, it becomes an interesting issue because there's no way to calculate out that period without this equation. So um, it becomes really challenging. We can't use kinematics. We can't use dynamics. We can't use simple harmonic motion. Um, and so we actually can't come up with a value for period if we're over to that 10 degrees, we're outside that region. And so you just say we're unable to calculate it. That would be like your answer. So a lot of people already have it here. I'm just going, uh, going kind of put the numbers in place. Um, and it looks like we have a consensus on about 1.79 seconds as our period. What would that mean the frequency is? If we wanted to ask for the frequency, what would our frequency be? Yeah, well, we do 1 over 1.79. Right, one over that, and we'd get out a value of 0 0.56, and we do want the units on there, and those units of frequency are hertz. Capital H, lowercase z. But overall, this equation is a pretty straightforward equation to use. Now, keep in mind, we could go backwards, right? I could give you the period, you could find the length, and then you could have to do something with it. We could also do something extra fun, like we could use the period and the length to find the value of g on a unknown planet. And then we could use that value of g to do things like predict the mass of the planet, or predict the how like a ball will fly through the air, or how fast something will fall if dropped, any of those sorts of fun things we can do. Right? So if we're thinking ahead to you know, combined problems or you're having to take a couple different concepts and, and smush them together, then, then that little g can tie us into, you know, uh, dynamics problems. It could tie us into kinematics or projectile motion problems. It could tie us into universal gravitational problems. All sorts of fun things. Okay. And now the final bit. We want to know the speed as it goes through equilibrium. 
And remember when we're looking at this, and I'm exaggerating this here because that's obviously an angle a lot bigger than 8 degrees. But we're looking at this 8, we need that height. And that height is going to be equal to the length of the pendulum minus the length times cos of theta. I appreciate that people are, are working ahead. This is good. Because I'm recording, I've got to, got to still write everything out. Um, so there's our equation. Our m's cancel out. We have just 2gh square root it to be equal to v. Remember to take this equation and sub it in down here for your h. And it looks like we've got a consensus. Uh, the v is 0 0.39 meters per second. And there we go. So that is, uh, that's that for today.